Your guide to the truth. The new American Media dot com. Broadcasting to you live from the Milky Way galaxy, the solar system, planet Earth, North America, the United States of America, California, Los Angeles to be specific. Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Agree to Disagree here on the TNAM Radio Network here on the NewAmericanMedia.com. My name is Brian Engelman. I'm your host as I have been for almost five years. Wow, how does time fly? <laughs> Seriously, half a decade doing this stuff. I mean, just think about the turmoil our country has been in for five years after the last collapse. And look at the Dow Jones today. What the heck? Okay, uh, 446, down 2.73% to 15,913. Okay, this is perhaps, well, no, this is the worst start to the stock market in United States history. Now, is that by percentage? Is that by this? Is that by that? Which parameters, which uh, statistics are we using to make such a blanket statement? Well, that's why we decided we want to get Gerald Salente into the program today. Gerald is the publisher of the Trends Journal. He's earned the reputation as today's most trusted name in trends for accurate and timely forecasts since 1980. Who, who better? Who, who would you rather have? On a day like today, then Gerald Salente to figure this out. Real quick before we get to the show, I want you to check out our homepage, thenewamericanmedia.com. On the right-hand side are three things. It's our TNAM radio button. That's where you click play to listen live. Underneath that, you have our Twitter feed. We're at American underscore media underscore. Underneath that, it's our Facebook feed, or you could do a search for The New American Media with spaces in between them and like our page on Facebook. And perhaps most importantly, uh, it's just a nice format. It's a nice platform to use, youtube.com slash The New American Media. Uh, all of our archived content is up there. Click subscribe. Uh, comment on some of the, the previous shows that we have done. Some of the shows we've done this week, we had Mr. Adam Kokesh on yesterday. On Tuesday, we had uh, Blake the Eccentric talking about, well, the L.A. Rams coming back home. And then we also talked, oh, you know, politics in general, stories in the news, including the Common Core fiasco. Um, we also had Laura Eisenhower on Monday. And we had Larry Elder last Friday. So w w there's a lot of really interesting interviews. I want you to go check it out. Easiest way sometimes for some people is youtube.com slash the new American media, or of course the homepage, the new American media.com. So without further delay, let's get Mr. Gerald Salente into the program. Phone call is always my favorite part of the show, by the way. Gerald Salenti. Gerald, this is Brian Engelman, and you are live on Agree to Disagree. How are you doing today, sir? Well, I agree to disagree. <laughs> Thank you for your time. You take care. Uh, <laughs> right. No, Gerald, I, I, was, I led with the intro saying there is no person I would rather have on the planet to be on my program today than Mr. Gerald Salente, someone we've listened to for so many years over at Trends Journal and TrendsResearch.com. Uh, Gerald, the stock market, they're saying this is the worst start of the, the stock market in U.S. history. What in the world is happening? Well, you know, I, I, I'm not saying this, you know, in a, in a way to brag, but, you know, our work as trend forecasters is to say what's going to happen before it happened. And when you go back to our top trends for 2016 <clears throat> that came out in early December, we said there would be waking up into the new, millenn into the new year and a great global recession would be underway. Mm. This is a reflection of that. Go back to our August 6th. We do trends in the news each night as part of the subscription to the Trends Journal. And I made the forecast that the markets would unravel this year. And at the end of the year, we came out with, the, on December 30th, our last broadcast of the year, we said you'd be waking up in the new year to, quote, the panic of 2016. Mm. Yeah, we lived through that in 2007, 2008, and it just kept going, it kept sliding, and I kept yelling at my television set along with millions of other Americans, hundreds of millions of people, um, globally just saying, what are you doing? Just find the bottom already. Why are you intervening and, and 
I, I called it Weekend at Bernie's. You know, he's, it's the dead boss. You prop him up. You put sunglasses on and a funny Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> and you just roll him around like, hey, here's the Wall Street stock market. Take a look. Keep investing. Nothing to see here. It's like, man, this thing is a corpse. Um, you know, do you think it could get as bad as it did in 2007, if not worse? It's, it's going to get much worse. Whew. Because, you know, you, you, you really, the way that you just summed it up, uh, uh, Brian, you did it perfectly. It's like, you know, putting this old guy up, you know, keeping him alive. They should have let the market unravel as it was, but the Federal Reserve intervened. So, by the way, anybody that calls this a failure of capitalism, they're mm -hmm. wrong. In capitalism, there's no such thing as too big to fail. You rise and fall on your own merits. Right. So they've killed capitalism, and they've put bankism in the place of it. So the only reason the markets kept going up is because of quantitative easing. Again, this has never happened in the history of the world, part one or part two. You can't make this stuff up. And the other one, of course, was zero interest rate policy. And what that did, it allowed, and you're seeing it with the numbers, the mergers and acquisitions. They're borrowing money for nothing, and they're buying up other companies. So you had merger and acquisition activity, for example, last year at record, record highs. And you know what record they topped last year? The one in 2007, just before the bubble burst. Mm, okay. So you can see where this is going. It has only been artificially inflated. It never reached we the people. Again, I'm not making that up. You can look at the numbers. The numbers don't lie. And the numbers show that from the panic of 08, 95% of the wealth gain went to 1%. As we saw with the latest study that came out, now a minority of Americans are middle class. As we're looking at the real numbers, median household income is below 1999 levels. So now the bubble has burst, and the reason I say it's worse, it's global because the whole global markets were pumped up from the United States, from the Bank of Japan, from the Chinese Central Bank, from the European Central Bank, with all of this fake money. And now you're looking, for example, you're looking at, at oil price declines. What are, the new year was down 20%. This is the worst unraveling of oil since OPEC. Go back to 19. This is the worst. Now, what does that mean? Well, hey, how about if you live in one of those cities or states where you really profited from that shale boom? Oh, and how about some 20% of the junk bonds, because people were putting their money in junk bonds, because go back to zero interest rate. You couldn't put your money in the bank and get anything. So you went into risky bonds, but hey, this energy sector is great. And now it's going bust. Some 20% of the junk bonds are in energy sector and mining sector. Now, take that and go worldwide. Look what's going on in South Africa. The RAND now is at an all-time low. Go to Nigeria, the largest exporter of oil into China. The largest exporter of oil out of Africa. They keep devaluing their currency, and now they're putting stops on it because half their oil goes into China. China's in a, in a meltdown. So this is a, this is, this is a time for people, I would suggest, and I don't give advice. You know, the motto of the Trends Journal is think for yourself. This is the way we see it. What I would suggest to people is that they prepare for the worst. Because if you don't prepare for the worst and the worst happens, you can lose everything. Yeah. But if you prepare for the worst and nothing happens, you've lost nothing. And one of the things that people really should consider, can you get your hands on the money that you have? How little it is, how great it is. What if they call a bank holiday? Isn't that a nice word, a bank holiday? Da, na, 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 I think na, Orwell na, na. must have made that up, right? Oh, yeah, a that's holiday? Newspeak. Yeah, that's Newspeak. I heard that before. I thought it yeah. before. Sure. So what will happen is if there's a terror strike, false flag or real, if this panic goes out of control, they'll close the banks. 
And the only way to get out of this is a devaluation of the currency. Now that would be a black, be- that would be a black swan event. You're you're saying kind of a convergence of everything at once, just an extra little push down the cliff. You got it. Okay. And if you don't believe me, look what they just did in Argentina. New president came in, closed the banks, devalued the currency thirty percent. People lost thirty percent of their purchasing power. They did that right here in the United States back in 1933. The the, the uh, the National uh, Banking Act, Emergency Banking Act, they force people to bring their gold in, gold coins, gold bullion, and gold certificates. Because back then, the dollar was backed by gold. The run on the banks that we hear about was because people were going into the banks and wanting gold for their dollars. They didn't have it. So they called a bank holiday, forced people to turn in their gold, and at those days, gold... So the dollar was, I think it was about $20.62 an ounce. After they reopened the banks when they got everybody's gold, they repegged the price of gold to $35 an ounce. Oh, yeah, it's a great scam if you can get in on it on, on the inside. If you're the one that crafts the policy and collects all the gold, what a beautiful scam to be in on. I mean, that's that's kind of what people are so frustrated with about, about fractional reserve banking in in general. It's, hey, like you said, do you even have the money that you think you have? Go to your bank and try to get it. See what's going to happen when you try to pull a few thousand bucks out. Do you even have it? The banks don't have it. You know, and it's like it's that, what is that? It's a wonderful life where it's not in your house. It's in his house. It's in his house. Um, a lot of people have zero faith in this system, and I think rightfully so. I do too. I think you know zero. We should do negative, like they do negative <laughs> interest rates. We should do negative zero <laughs> on on the trust level, Our, because again, I could tell you of, of a real story when nine eleven happened. You know, and, and I had been writing about this kind of thing happening. It was USA Today, right? My top trends. In, for 20, 2001 in, on, in December of 2000 just before the, the new year and I had 2001 won't be our year Trendseer says and I warned of a wave of anti-Americanism and that Americans wouldn't be safe at home or abroad so as 9-11 is unfolding you know I was first. one of the first things I did is I called the bank I had CDs they used to have interest rates back in those days you put your money in certificates of deposit and actually make money right. and my money was in Fleet Bank which is fleeted away it was bought up by one of the big guys but back then I call them up I want my money transferred to Rhinebeck which is where I was at. our offices were in those days Rhinebeck, New York two hours north of New York City and I'm a New York City guy you know born in the Bronx I know the city they're telling me the planes are coming down the Hudson River I watched this thing go into the World Trade Center I know where their nuclear power plant is in Indian Point in Verplank. I said, holy God, if they hit that thing, man, there's going to be chaos like we've never seen. Yeah. So I call up the bank. I want my money. I had it in CDs. Sorry, Mr. Salenti, that certificates of deposit of financial instruments traded on Wall Street, and Wall Street's closed. That's right. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, when you think about the black swan event, you think about the 9-11, you think about these things with the worst case scenario, like you said, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. Yeah, that's all well and good if the system is functional. And and some people say, oh, it's apocalyptic to think this way. Oh, you're just, you're a fear monger. You're into fear porn. No, I don't think so. I, th- I, th- I was raised a Boy Scout. I was always told to be prepared, be prepared, be prepared. And hopefully we don't have to deal with it, but you're right. Sometimes you try to go get what you think you have. If it's not there, it's not there. And, and you know, as we look at what's going on with the stock market now, we're saying, okay, oil. A couple questions on oil here. Do you think, this is a question we got from Michael McDonald Hartman. He's asking, uh, what's going to come first, $20 or $40 in oil, uh, a barrel for oil? Again, when you do trends, you have to take a broad view, making connections between different fields. I believe where we are near oil, you have what another couple of dollars up or down, I think this is the range we're going to settle in. However, having said that, it could go down to 20. There's no, no question about it. You have to make the connections between different fields. Look what's going on over there in the Middle East. Look at America's great ally, the Saudis. <laughs> yeah. They're the beheaders in chief. Boy, they make ISIS look like rookies. It's unreal. Boy, they do 47 in one day. Happy New Year. Oh, but they and had they, secret and, trials. They had secret trials, though. Don't worry about it. They, they got it and, right. And, 
and they where they cut off the head of the one of the uh, the leading Shia clerics. Yeah. Meanwhile, they're bombing Yemen on a daily basis, killed over ten thousand people. Four million Yemenis live in Saudi Arabia. The Shias, who was a Sunni Shia uh, fight going on over there, they're in eastern Saudi Arabia where the oil is. Shocking. I'm surprised by that. So now you start looking at all these countries, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Qatar. Hey, Qatar just cut out uh, Al Jazeera America, right? I did see that. That was very interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised Al Jazeera didn't take in America. <laughs> Actually, in so, today's climate, I might be a little surprised by that. But they just cut back on their, their TV station. Could it be the, the oil prices that are falling to nothing? So when I'm, to answer the question, you go back to Saudi Arabia, for example, and this is about equal along the board. They need $100 a barrel just to have their, their, their economy break even. And, and, that, and that, that's what gets me thinking about the geopolitical side of things here is when you talk about oil, you, you've, you've heard this over and over when we're, we're getting into northern Africa and there's a proxy war going on and you're talking about Iran and you're talking about Russia. How much of this has to do with a geopolitical battle to weaken Russia by devaluing oil? Is this just a coincidence or it's a, it's a convenience that it happens to be happening at the same time? No, we don't see any connection, actually. Really? And I'll tell you why. It's, you look at the, the whole level of commodity prices, Brian, on average, according to the Bloomberg Index, they're down to 1999 levels. Mm. You're looking at iron ore, for example. In 2011, it was going for um, uh, almost $200 a metric ton. Today, it's selling for 40 Oh. Does that make that you a good look, buy opportunity, yeah. or it's just... It's so chaotic now. There's no, there's too much supply and not enough demand. Okay. It's across the board. It's oil. It's co- it's it's copper. Copper is down to two thousand and nine levels. Hmm. It it's it's wheat. It's corn. It's soybeans. It, it, it's it's out of the twenty two major commodities, only one went up last year, and that was cotton, and that only went up like three point six percent. And it's pro- it's now it's back you know it, it's losing that it, it won't go up much anyway. What I'm saying is it's bigger than oil. That's what I'm saying. Right. This is a global slowdown. Look look what just happened today. Walmart's announced they're closing a couple of hundred stores. Reading my mind. Yep, that's where I was headed. Look at the industrial production numbers. I've been doing this work since 1980. After every Christmas holiday. They're always cheering about the Christmas sales, even when they're not that great. This year, here we are now, January 15th, and they finally announced what the holiday sales were, and they were dismal. Had nothing to do with, well, the people aren't going to their malls because they're buying it online. No, it's only about 10% of the purchases. They're way down. Then people say, wait, well, wait a minute. With oil prices going down, less to fill up the car and heat the house, you know, that should boost the, no, no, not in a deflationary cycle. It's called a depression. So hmm. if a dozen eggs only cost 25 cents during the depression, and you didn't have 25 cents to buy the eggs, it made no difference. Yeah, and out here so in California, pe- the oil prices, you, I mean, you fill up the gas tank, sure, it's not north of $4, but it's still $3 a gallon at $30 a barrel. You just go, wait a minute. Why am I still paying three dollars? Of course, a lot of that is California taxes and craziness. But you know, yes, in theory, you hear cheaper oil. You go, that's great. That's less money I got to spend every week in the car. But it doesn't work that way. It's actually a really bad thing when oil gets scary low like this, right? It's what I'm saying. It's a it's a major deflationary cycle. I mentioned to you what happened with with the Great Depression when they devalue the currency right. it's a depressionary cycle this is a depression and and the people's prices and wages wages and and income are depressed and then yeah you're saving a couple of bucks on gas hey how much did your uh, did your your ins- medical insurance go up doubled mine doubled I lost my uh, doctor I lost my hospital it damn near doubled um, I lost my prescription coverage yeah it was kind of a big mess kind of kind of fraud I would call it fraud 
Well, you see, I would call it fascism. And the reason is, I mean, you mentioned, I mentioned too big to fail, for example. And when there is no such thing in a capitalist society as too big to fail. So when they have too big to fail, that's called the merger of state and corporate powers. Right. It's called fascism, by definition. When we're being forced to buy our medical insurance from private corporations, that's called the merger of state and corporate powers. It's called fascism. Right. And then you bring it down to the level of, you know, if they want to stop you, you know, the cops in Texas or wherever, and want to draw blood from you to see if you've been drinking, that's called fascism. Yeah. So it, it, it keeps going down the line. So that's what I would say to, in my terminology and looking at the facts, we're losing our rights, as we all know, at so many different levels. And this is just another one, because at the same time, again, only the facts that the Obama administration did not prosecute one major bank for criminal activities. And that's not a speculation, because six major banks were convicted, convicted of felonies for rigging the interest rates, the LIBOR rates, and the forex markets, the currency markets, which trade, by the way, at $5.3 trillion a day, convicted of felonies. You see anybody go to jail? No. No, and I also saw candidate Ted Cruz not show up for the audit the Fed bill and know his connections with Goldman Sachs. And you see, okay, Barack Obama, what's he doing? Continuing the George Bush policies, and they got the same corporate donors. And then you look at the next batch of candidates and go, all right, the question we have from Sam House, he's asking, Gerald, is there any hope? So I guess politically, is there anyone on the stage, anyone at all, even in the fringe candidate realm, that understands this that we might be able to get behind? Or is it just we got to buckle up because we're getting more of the same crap? Well, with the word he used, hope, hope is the most negative word the diction, in the metaphysical dictionary. And I could give you to proof of it. Hope and change you could believe in. <laughs> I've heard that movie. I've seen that movie before. You've heard that? Yeah, yeah, you saw yeah. that one, huh? Yeah, yeah. Like me, folks. Yeah. And anyway, yes, <laughs> no, there's nobody there. The only thing I like about Trump is that he showed, you know, our cover of our Spring Trends Journal was the presidential reality show. Matter of fact, we even trademarked the name. Nice. And this was before Trump got into the race back oh, in the spring oh, of 2015. Okay. All right. So now we have a real reality show champion there. <laughs> yeah, we so do. So what I like about him is he showed what a fraud this whole thing is and has disrupted it. So where the opportunity lies, because he's very thin, he's just sound bites. He repeats the same words three and four times. You see, you see, you see? I told you, I told you, I told you. You know, it, it, there's nothing there. And by the way, he's a guy, you know, born in the Bronx, you know, New York City guy. A guy like Trump, we used to call these guys, they're born on third and thought they hit a triple. Yeah, I heard you know, that about he's, Bush, he's, right. Yeah, you know, his old man left him all this dough and a, and, a, and a red carpet to the Golden Doors, and he brags <laughs> about how brilliant he is. Yeah, you know, Ted, take it easy, Jack. Ted, Ted Cruz was, it, was just hitting him on that, calling it New York Values, and he, he swung back yesterday in the debate. It was an interesting moment. Well, yeah, well, that, well, that was a stupid thing, too. New York Values. The other one is New, New Yorkers don't take crap from other people. Yeah. <laughs> and I went, That's our I, attitude, too. I, yeah. I went down there to 9-11. I went down to Ground Zero a couple months after 9-11. I just, it felt like a reality show. It didn't seem real to me. It felt like a diehard just, that just kept playing on a loop. So we drove in from uh, Bowling Green, Ohio, I don't know, 10 hours or however long it took. And I'll tell you what, for all the negative crap that, that, that people give um, to New Yorkers and the attitude and this and that, I have never met a more united, friendly, uh, confident, focused, uh, determined batch of people in my lifetime. You could feel it in the air. So, you know, I, I know what Cruz was going for with the liberal values of a Los yeah. Angeles or a Manhattan, but, yeah, it didn't come off as well. Yeah, so going back to who I think could, uh, we, we believe, again, I'm a political atheist. Uh, by the way, just very briefly, at a graduate school, 
I, I used to run political campaigns in Westchester County, you know, just north of New York City, at that time the richest county in the United States. I was the assistant to the secretary of the New York State Senate, and I designed and instructed American politics and campaign technology at St. John, taught at St. John's University, and I was a chief government affairs specialist for the chemical industry in the, in the 70s, from 74 to 79. So I spent a lot of time in D.C. at pictures of me and Ronald Reagan, this one, that one. I've been around. One of our chief writers for the Trends Journal is Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, former assistant treasury secretary under Reagan. So we guys that know what it looks like. So when I say I'm a political atheist, there's nobody there I would vote for. I don't do anything with lesser of two evils. I don't do business with them, don't have relationships with them, don't invite them into my home, and I certainly wouldn't want them to run my life. I was not put on this earth to be taking orders from a lesser of two evils. Having said that, our forecast is Hillary Clinton's going to win wow. at this point. Wow. And that's because she's going to get the woman vote. And when you look at the data, about 10 million more women vote than men, more than that actually. And when you look back at the last two elections, Obama got between 10 and 12% more of the women vote than the Republicans. And she's playing the gender card every day. You know, my grandmother was a grandmother, and my mother was a mother, and I'm a grandmother, and I was a mother, and you know, on and on and on. So she's playing the gender card. She is. It's kind of all she has in her bag of tricks. And I'm actually surprised, Gerald, because you see George, uh, I'm sorry, Jeb Bush on the Republican side. You know, you see one oligarch family and you see a Clinton family over on the other side. They've totally rejected, the primary voters have totally rejected Jeb Bush, I think kind of based on name only. I mean, yes, he's a, he's, he's a stutterer. He, he's very stiff and rehearsed and not charismatic, low energy guy, if you will. But I, I guess... I'm not surprised that the people have rejected Bush, but I am surprised that they haven't rejected Hillary. It's, is it really just uh, – I did a show it, on this two weeks ago that Hillary, people are only in love in the concept of voting for Hillary to cross women off the social checklist. That's a big part of it. The other part is I have a line, conservatives believe and liberals lie. I mean, there's the, would the arch conservatives say things like, you know, we've got to kill them over there before they come over here. Yeah, all right, great. Yeah, it ain't going to work, Jack. But they actually believe that. The liberals lie. And I'll give you an example. When you heard Obama's speech about a couple of weeks ago about you know gun control, how tears come down his eyes when he thinks of the children that have been killed. How many people does this guy kill with drones? Yeah. 23,000 bombs dropped last year by the United States in Muslim nations. 23,000 bombs. He bragged on his State of the Union address over 10,000 airstrikes. If he was, say, if George W. Bush was saying those things, those quiche-eating liberals with those balsamic <laughs> smiles, the politically correct Woodstock crowd, would be all screaming and yelling at George Bush, oh, yeah. but they give their Obama a free ride. It's incredible. Going back to why Hitler, you know, that's my campaign slogan, by the way. Campaign 2016, Trump or Clinton, Hitler or Hitler. <laughs> a march toward more domineering global control. It's And, and you see it with, the, with technology. Like, the, if Hitler had the NSA spy apparatus that, that we have today, it would have been game over. It, 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 I just say you've you got to keep ruling families away from this much power uh, for extended periods of time because it corrupts absolutely and they get influenced. Um, th th real quick, because I, I know we're running out of time here, um, we had Larry Elder, a uh, talk show host on uh, about a week ago, and he, he's kind of said a similar version of your quote. He said, conservatives believe what they see and liberals see what they believe. And I thought yeah. that was very sharp, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's why Hillary's going to win, because they're hypocrites. The only way we're, this nation is going to move forward in a positive way, as we see it, is not only a third party, but a fourth and a fifth. We have to stop letting the Bloods and the Crips, called the Democrats and the Republicans, run and ruin our lives. And I don't say that sarcastically. They steal our money in the name of too big to fail tax breaks, loan guarantees, and, and other kind of things that they give to their buddies 
and they kill millions of people in the name of freedom and democracy and humanitarian missions. So we need a, we need a new way. We need, we need morality coming back into the system, and none of these cats can show an ounce of it. Yeah, and, and it gets back to, well, what are we supposed to do with that? You know, avoid the hope word here. Final question to you, Gerald Salente. Uh, by the way, if people haven't checked out your work, um, where, where's the best place to do that? Just to go to trendsresearch.com? Or you have any other places you want people to check no, out? that'll be fine. Trendsresearch.com. And, of course, they go on to YouTube. They'll see Gerald Salente. They could see we put up YouTube's. We, we, we broadcast five nights a week, but we every weekday, but we put one up a week for the public to see. Gotcha. Now, now pragmatically, last question here, Gerald, and thank you for your time. Um, when you said prepare for the worst, hope for the best, okay, that's fantastic. Not hope. Not hope. Oh, yeah. Don't hope. Prepare for the worst. If the worst doesn't happen and you lost <laughs> nothing. Okay. In preparing for the worst, what is your recommendation to Mr. and Mrs. America right now? What, what right, can, For me. Only speaking for myself. For don't you. spend a dime that you don't have to. Okay. Consider getting, you know, and consider getting in the best shape you can, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Hmm. And also, I'm a believer in gold. Again, if you go, we're not far from us. There's a place called Canada. What did they lose? Their loonies down to seventy cents against the dollar. I mentioned Argentina, thirty percent devaluation. Take a trip to Venezuela, two hundred percent inflation. Go back to, uh, to, to to Ghana, Nigeria, Niger, South Africa. One currency after another collapsing. Would you rather have gold or a collapsing currency? If everything collapses, what would you rather have? So to me, gold, and only again speaking for myself, is the safe haven asset. And we are forecasting that when the price of gold goes up, it's going to skyrocket up. And does the same apply to silver? Is it precious metals or I'm not No, because to me, silver, it'll, silver will go up. Uh, more gold, because gold, because silver is also used in industrial production. Okay. And, and, and gold isn't. But however, having said that, I would still consider silver as well. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm more bullish on gold, but silver is a good bet in my mind as well. And don't spend any dollar that you don't have to. You don't have, have to. to. Now don't that, spend a penny that you don't have to. And before you start wasting money on sending your kids to school or going to school to get degrees in worthlessness right. at these universities, you better think more than twice. If you're going to go there and not get an education that you could put into an employment perspective, don't do it. You're going to get a Oh, I'm going to go study anthropology. <laughs> no, I got a better one. How about art history? You know, yeah, wonderful if you could afford it and your daddy's Donald Trump. You know, it's it's funny you say that because uh, over here in our homeowners association, our landscaper, we're working with him, and his kid was out there working on bi installing some stuff the other day, and he's telling me, Gerald, he says, well, you know, I'm in college, I'm going to school for this and that, but yeah, now my dad took over this company, and he's bringing me in to help with marketing, and we had this little talk, and I just stopped and looked at him and said, you know what, man, you're sitting here holding the possibility of a job where people have to actually physically have talent skill ability an existing client base why in the world would you roll the dice on a worthless degree when you have an opportunity in front of you and your father's begging you to take a look at this you know and it's i think these conversations are happening more and more in america and i think maybe we will have a return to values like that i know my grandparents always told me to be very careful with my money i watched how they lived i watched how they spent and i think our country is in store for a nice dose of that right now maybe out of necessity. But hey, Gerald Salente, thank you so much for your time. I'd like to do this again. Uh, any final words for people on your way out the door? Yeah, really stay in touch with what's going on and don't buy the propaganda. And then the motto of the Trends Journal is think for yourself. And people really need to do that now. And again, get in the best shape you can physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Prepare for the worst. If the worst doesn't happen, you've lost nothing. If the worst happens and you haven't prepared, you could lose everything. Very true. Gerald, thank you so much for your time. 
I hope we can do this again sometime soon. You have a great day, a great weekend. Until next time. And for everybody out there in the TNAM radio network, I want to thank you for listening. Please check out the archive of shows at youtube.com slash the new American Media at our homepage, the new American Media.com. Follow us on Twitter at American underscore media underscore and link up with us on Facebook. Check out all of our shows. We've done a lot of good ones where we have a couple conventions coming up. It's going to be real interesting over here. So for everybody at the TNAM Radio Network, special thanks to guest Gerald Salente. My name's Brian Engelman. I'm signing out. I appreciate you. I love you. We'll talk again soon. Take care. Peace. Hi, everybody. You're listening to Agree to Disagree with Brian Engelman, and this is John B. Wells reminding you that not only is Brian Engelman a cool guy, and not only is the NewAmericanMedia.com a very cool platform, but here's a cool idea for you, too. Are you alone? Not really. Do you like dogs? Do you like cats? You do. Of course you do. Everybody does. One or the other, maybe even both. You know, there are a lot of dogs and cats that are at shelters right now, and if somebody doesn't take them home, they're going to wind up euthanized. That's a nice way of saying they're going to be killed because there's simply not enough room. I guarantee it, the best dogs and the best cats, the best pets, come from shelters. There's something about dogs and cats. They know. They know where they are. You walk through one of them, and certainly at least one is going to look at you and go, I wish you'd take me home. I'm in hell. Please take me out of here. It'll be the best thing that you ever did for your soul. You'll feel good about it. And not only that... But you have a friend for life. doesn't matter if you've got money, you don't have money. What well, doesn't make any difference to a dog or a cat? All they need is the sound of your voice and maybe even the stroke of your hand, and they're fine. Maybe a little food every once in a while. The sweetest sound that those pets ever hear is your voice. Think it over and adopt a cat or a dog from a local shelter today. I'm telling you, you'll be glad you did.